Hello, good afternoon. It is good to be back here again. This is my second rise, and I think it's a much larger presence this year, right? It's great to be back here. Can you guys hear me right at the back? Well, hopefully this year we've got more gamers than uh, we've had last year. But uh, it's truly an honor to be over here. And um, for the guys that may not necessarily be familiar with us, at Razer, I'm Min, co-founder and CEO of Razer. I've been spending quite a bit of time recently over here in Hong Kong. And um, it's great to be over here with everyone. Now, for those of you who may not necessarily be familiar with us, in a single line, and this is not working at this point of time again, because I didn't design this, <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> this isn't working. Um, help? Let me try that again. It is not. So I'm going to have to do some filler kind of uh, entertainment at this point of time, which I hope I don't have to. <laughs> I'm not really good at telling jokes. Oh, here we go. Wait, back. Boom. All right. So in a single line today, I think many of you guys are familiar with us. Um, we are the world's leading lifestyle brand for gamers. And, and to be clear, you know, I think um, We've recently filed our A1 to go public in Hong Kong, so you'll see a lot of uh, disclaimers peppered through the whole presentation. So bear with that, and someday many of you are going to have to go through that anyway. So the world's leading lifestyle brand for gamers, that's in a single line what we are at Razer. And um, through the course of meeting many of the VCs, the startup founders, and many of you over here, one of the big questions I've always gotten is, what have we learned in the past couple of years going global? What were the challenges? What were the things that um, we would like to be able to mentor, tell everyone about? And uh, I thought we'd take the opportunity today to kind of share with every single one of you, the startup founders out here, the lessons we learned at Razer going global. And today, we're the number one gaming brand in the US, we're the number one gaming brand in Europe, and of course, even right here in Asia, in China, we also have a leadership role. And to this extent, the three lessons we learned going global are pretty much the things that we wish we had known right from the start. So without much further ado, I thought I would share our personal journey that we've gone on through the past 12 years since we were founded, you know, I'm going to share a little bit of our strategy, which you will be able to, sh to kind of um, understand yourself, um, having gone through many of these challenges ourselves. So 12 years ago, there were two of us. We founded the company. Today, we're all over the globe, nine offices worldwide. We've got about 800 employees, all with a single mission of four gamers by gamers. So the first lesson we really learned was to do something, to do one thing well. And this is a truism I'm sure many of your VCs have also told you, you know, along the way, it's better to do one thing really well than 10 things really badly, right? That's something I'm sure many of you hold near and dear and focus on that. But when it comes down to going global, that's not enough because it's not enough to do one thing well anymore. We go global. You've got to be able to do one thing really well. You've got to keep doing it well and repeat over and over again. And that's the hardest part about it, to be able to do that over and over. And I want to share a little bit about what we did in the past couple of years as we went global in the US, Europe, Asia, and really spread ourselves through each and every one of the jurisdictions. So, Case on point, 2005, when we founded the company Razer, we were focused on just the humble gaming mouse. We didn't just create the gaming mouse, we created an entirely new category of peripherals today, the gaming peripherals category. And we went on to do the gaming keyboards, we went on to do gaming audio. And all that went phenomenally well for us. Every single new category we moved into, we had to invest in it. We lost some money because of R&D, because of marketing. But as a whole, we went and extended our categories over and over. Like many of you out there right now focused on your single product, 
as you grow the categories, you'll be looking at adjacencies to move into. And that's what happened. And for ourselves today, for gaming peripherals, we are number one, we're now the number one global brand in the US, Europe, and in China. And we've done phenomenally well from, from that perspective. But remember, at that juncture, for ourselves, as we thought about it, as we went global, did we want to be a peripherals company? Absolutely not. That wasn't the vision, and we needed to do something. We needed to continue doing this really well, but to look for more adjacencies, more things we could challenge ourselves, to more things for us to grow. And we went on to say, great. We're now number one for gaming peripherals. We are still today number one in terms of gaming peripherals, but what next? So we looked at gaming systems in 2011. Of course, we started investing in it way before 2011. And it was important for us to look at, at that juncture, a completely new category. Now, bear in mind, you rarely see peripherals companies going into systems. It's really, really hard. It's a completely new discipline. You've got a completely new engineering team to deal with, new distribution channels. You've got new marketing method, methods. You've got new buyers, so on and so forth. And in 2011, we decided to go into gaming systems. And many of you in the, in the audience, I'm sure, constantly, you're asking yourselves, is this a good time for me to be extending beyond what I'm really doing well at this point of time to take on another challenge? And the question for you really is, can you do it well? It doesn't matter what people tell you, whether you can or cannot. You have got to weigh the pros and cons. You've got to consider all the options. And for us, in 2011, we felt this was a huge unmet need. It didn't matter that HP was there. It didn't matter that Dell was there. It didn't matter that every single person I went to, people who made laptops, told me that it's impossible. There will not be another major PC brand in the world at this point of time because this market is done, it's dusted. Don't get into that. But we believed that we have already done things well from the peripherals perspective, and we can continue to do that well, plus repeating it over and over again. So today, we are one of the top three global brand names in gaming laptops. We continue to grow. And bear in mind, focus is still incredibly important because for the past six years, since we've launched our gaming laptop in uh, the Razorblade line that um, have become incredibly popular, for the past six years, we've only focused on the US market. Why? Because we know that to build a new business, it's like a completely new startup as you grow global. You've got to make sure that you take care of the customers. You've got to make sure the customer satisfaction is perfect, the technical support. And only this year, after six years, we've started going global. We've started shipping in Europe. And that is how we've really extended ourselves. But to be truly global, you've got to do this over and over again. And you've got to be able to focus that every single thing you do, because the market, it's um, incredibly unforgiving. And everyone out there is going to tell you it's really hard. And it's not just the guys outside the company, it's guys inside the company. And so on and so forth. So hardware, for the past couple of years, in the past three years, we've already shipped over a billion dollars worth of hardware, and we are still growing this business right now. Why? Because we're still expanding the distribution channels, we're still getting into these stores, and we're still focused that everything that we do, we've got to keep doing it well, continue keeping doing it well, so to speak, and then rinse, repeat, and over. So, hardware wasn't enough for us. We went on and said, wouldn't it be cool, and this was in 2007, wouldn't it be cool if all these connected devices could come together and call back to the cloud? The question for us at that point of time, the question for you at any pivot point in your company, in your startup, is can you do that well? And that has got to be an objective question. You've got to make sure you've got the right talent, you've got the right mindset, and bear in mind that while 
the peripheral engineering teams are completely different from the laptop engineering teams. Likewise, the mindset for designing great hardware is completely different from the mindset of creating a software platform. Rarely do you hear of companies who are able to straddle both of them, and it's a huge challenge. And because it's a huge challenge, many companies don't do that. But since then, from building out our software platform, we've got Synapse, which today we call an IoT platform, because back then we called it a connected devices platform. We didn't have a good name for it, so it took a while before the buzzwords came to catch up. An RGB lighting system, Chroma, that is used throughout the industry, and our own game launcher on the platform, and we've built a 35 million registered user platform for our software. And that by itself, if you carve out the rest of the business, with 35 million users on our platform, that is a massive software platform. It's one of the biggest independent third-party game platforms out there by itself, without considering any of the other things that we do. And because of that, we have to always focus over and over again that everything that we do must meet the benchmark. It must be done well. So hardware has been great, over a billion dollars over the past three years, 35 million registered users on our software platform. And just this year, in 2017, in March, we said, great, we've done that phenomenally well. We've built out the hardware platform, and that's growing year on year. We're going to look at new categories to invest in. We're going to continue disrupting new, new areas of business when it comes to the hardware. We're going to continue growing the software platform. 35 million users is great. It's going to be 40. It's going to be 50. We just want to continue keep, keeping doing well in what we, we've set out to do. And this year, we've launched Razer Z Gold. What is Z Gold or Z Gold, depending on which part of the world you're from? In short, it is a virtual currency, I'm sorry, it's a virtual credit system. It's a virtual credit service that will allow you to spend money in over 2,500 different game titles. So over 2,500 different game titles, and in the short amount of time from March till today, we've now become potentially the largest virtual credits service in Southeast Asia. By partnering up with our friends at MOL, for example, we are now spread out over a million distribution points. It's all about execution. It's not enough to just dream and think, I'm going to be able to do that. But execution is key. But before you embark on any of these endeavors, it's incredibly important to do that. And bear in mind, Building a hardware business is very hard. Building a software platform, 35 million users, really hard. Building a fintech business today, which is what Zgold is, is incredibly hard too. But getting three of them to play conjunctively at the same time over and over again and executing over and over again is what is going to, to separate you between being a local player and a global player. So, in short, we've created a leading lifestyle brand for gamers. We've always been an ecosystem company. We've built it out, and we continue building that out from the perspective of being able to execute that. And that's the first lesson we've really learned, to do one thing well. And not just one thing. We, we've got to keep doing it well. And then rinse and repeat over and over again. And that's the first lesson we've learned in the past 12 years going global. And I, I would say that the second lesson we've learned is probably the most important over here. Every day I, I go through it till today, you know. And that is, in short, to stay true to your vision. And this is trite. Many of you have heard that. Stay true to your vision follow your passion, so on and so forth. But it's, it's easier said than done. Because when I say staying true to your vision, there will be a whole host of different people that will pull you away from your initial vision. Some of you will waver. Many of you, I hope, will not. 
And when I say the people that will pull you from your vision as you go global are, you know, it could be your your senior management that you hire, because at some point of time, you're going to say, I got to hire senior management who have done it before. You're going to bring in a senior guy who's, who's seen everything there is. And he's going to say, this doesn't make any sense. You shouldn't do it. You're going to have you know, members of the public telling you, oh, that's a horrible, horrible idea. Many of whom have absolutely no idea what you're up to or what your true vision is. Always stay true to your vision. And again, this is easier said than done. So when we first started, we were very clear what we wanted to be. We wanted to be a company for gamers by gamers, which is actually another excuse for designing products I wanted for myself, right? Which, you know, you guys will laugh, but many of you guys are probably doing the same thing, all right? So, and I met many VCs at the point of time, you know, in the early days. And more often than not, somebody would say, isn't that a really tiny niche? But bear in mind, we knew we were not there to found a company for the approval of a VC, however wise or, or smart they are or you are in the audience. We were not there to do anything for anyone but ourselves with our vision for gamers by gamers, no matter if someone told us, isn't that a really tiny niche? And this was back in 2005, remember? So as I mentioned, we started with gaming peripherals. And this is a great way to kind of show what we had to go through and, and the thought process. And I'll share a little bit because we brought in some of the experts, consultants from the outside um, at a bit of a pivot point early in the company. And we had a dominant position in gaming peripherals. We have a dominant position in gaming peripherals. And it is a business. And now we are going into the nuts and bolts of business. It's a high margin business compared to the rest of consumer electronics. It's a great business to be in. It's got lower R&D expenses, all right? And it's got less competition for what it's worth. High margins for consumer electronics, lower R&D expenses, less competition. It's the dream for many of the finance guys out there. Great work. They love that. So we brought in some of the senior guys, and they looked at our business. And I, one day I said to them, you know something, guys? We're going to go into gaming systems. We're going to go into gaming laptops. Bear in mind, this was in 2009, 2008, where we first started exploring it. And what was happening at that point of time? PCs on a huge decline. Every single quarter, you'd read about how there are no margins in the PCs anymore. Everyone's getting wiped out. Incredibly high R&D expenses. You know, intense competition. Everyone was belting it out at that point of time. And in a single line, everyone said, why do it? And bear in mind, it wasn't just people internally within the company. It wasn't just the senior consultants that we brought in. They said, look, be careful. What's going to happen is this. You've got your high margins over here. Wall Street loves that. That's great. You're going to go into lower margins and blend that. It's going to come down. You're going to have to invest heavily in the next couple of years. Who are you to say that you can disrupt this industry? What are you going to do? Why do it? It doesn't make any sense for many of the people out there at the first blush. Outside of that, even our customers, your customers, will be sometimes asking the same question. You guys make great peripherals. Please, please, don't do anything else. We want you to continue being a, a peripherals company forever, so to speak. Why do it? Well. Because in a single line, we are a company for gamers by gamers. That was our vision. Our vision is to continue creating great products, great software, great services for gamers everywhere. We are not a peripherals company. We are not a hardware company. We are not a company that we would allow someone to pigeonhole us. And likewise, for every single one of you, it's important to crystallize what your vision is right from the get-go, and to remember that. Because in the future, you will bring in these experts. You will have you know, investors who will, with, with great positive intent, and I'm not talking about anyone trying to sabotage your, your, your vision. It's because 
the most important thing is all of these guys come with positive intent. They want to help you. They know how hard it is. They are going to dissuade you because they know how difficult it is. But fast forward many years, today we're one of the top three brands in gaming laptops. We've completely disrupted the ecosystem. As PCs are still coming down, but you know what's going up within the PC category? Gaming laptops. You know who is one of the top brands? We are. But back then, if we didn't start looking at this premise to know that we, ha we weren't just going to disrupt the gaming peripheral space, we were going to disrupt gaming laptops, if we didn't stay true to our vision, if we listened to the experts, that would have what, been what ha would have happened. Software. Again, we had members in the team saying, wow, you've got a high margin business for peripherals. Uh, and, and literally, this was a discussion. They said, look, why are you investing in a, this massive connected devices um, strategy to get 35 million registered users or, or even more? These are strategic decisions that every single one of you will have to think and take. And execution, incredibly important. Today, we still invest significant R&D resources every single day to grow this number even further because we never saw ourselves as a company that would sell hardware and say, forget about it, and I'm, I'm not going to take, you know, talk to the customer anymore. Our customers, gaming is a religion for all of us. And for that, we have an ongoing relationship. The software platform allows us to reach out to our customers, to engage with them, to chat with them over and over again. And that's the 35 million customers that we have. And with the benefit of hindsight today, if we didn't have the hardware software platform, we would never have been able to launch services on top of that. And these services have margins way beyond that of hardware. The same margins that the experts were concerned about, today all the concerns are now gone. They're going, wow, you're now able to do virtual credits? That's insane. Where did that platform come from? Now, the platform didn't come from out of the blue. We didn't build this platform in a matter of three months, six months, etc. It's been a labor of love for the past couple of years because we've always been focused on our vision. We've always been focused on what the gamers wanted. So think about it. Now, in short, we are a company for gamers by gamers. We are not a peripherals company. We are not a laptop company. We are not a software platform company. We just want to put our customer right in the middle. Of course, it's no coincidence that a customer is myself, right? Right in the middle. To design products that we want for ourselves because we knew when the gaming laptop market needed to be disrupted because I needed a gaming laptop for myself. I could travel. Today, we can understand that there are many options. We want to be able to, to purchase um, in-game uh, transactions and so on and so forth. And that's why we created the currency or the credit service to be able to, to take advantage of that. But all of this would have been, would have been sabotaged or, or, or waylaid right from the get-go if we didn't stay true to our cause. And, and again, all of this is with good intent. Everyone advising you is with good intent to tell you that it's really hard. No one's ever disrupted the PC market. Be careful. That's with good intent. But it's with absolute great intent that you must stay true to your cause all the time, stay true to your vision. And remember that the many people or the or the guys that tell, told me that this tiny niche of gaming back in 2005, this tiny niche of gaming has grown to 2.2 billion gamers out there. And by the way, back in the day when I first started out, I remember thinking, when I'm a $100 million company, I'm going to be able to get all these professional advisors and stuff like that to come in. It gets harder and harder all the time. It does not get easier. And for all of you looking to go global, just a word of advice, there is only one day that usually becomes a little easier for you in the course of a week. 
If you're in Asia, it's on Sunday morning. If you're in the US, it's on Saturday evening, right? Why? Because at that point of time, most people aren't firing emails at you at, at any juncture because on, uh, as you can see, you know, the world is just going to be coming through over and over again. And if you think you're going to be stressed, if you think you're stressed out right now, as you go global, it's going to be there 24 seven every single day. It does not get easier, especially when you try to go global at the same time. So that tiny niche, 2.2 billion gamers out there today. And we have that single brand that really represents all of them. And of course, this conversation is going to go on. We are going to have others going to say, hey, have you thought about the other aspects or the other categories? Why are you going into those other categories? Why are you investing? Why are you looking at trying to disrupt new categories? Are you sure you can do it? It's so hard. And that's the thing. You've got to keep doing one thing well. You've got to keep doing it well. And you've got to be confident and know exactly what you're going to disrupt. So that's the second lesson, which I think would be truly important for us. And today, we still relive it over and over again to stay true to our vision. The third lesson is, again, trite. And many of you may, may say, well, I know this. It's always about the people. And what kind of people are we talking about? We're talking about the customers. It's not just your team. We're talking about the customers. We're talking about the team. And we're talking about the investors at the same time. And, and these three are really important people that you should talk to. So customers, when you're going global, please, for the love of God, localize, localize, localize. And this is, this is one of those things that we've learned going from the US to Europe, to China, to Asia, where 50% of our sales are in the Americas right now, 27% of our sales are in Europe, and 23%, look, I, I know my numbers, 23% of our sales are in APAC at this point of time. And there are very few companies that are able to straddle, tech companies that are able to straddle the American market, the European market, and the Asian market at the same time. Where 13% of our sales are in China. We are one of the top brands over there in Europe, in China. Because we understand that every single customer is unique. As, and always listen to your customers, especially if they speak a different language. And that's really important. You've got to be able to understand and localize products for them because for ourselves as gamers, and many of you will have different customers. Some of you will have enterprise customers. Some of you may have uh, customers in the wellness space or the beauty space or, or fashion, what have you. It doesn't matter. Always localize. We've made our mistakes before. We've gone into markets thinking, look, it's fine. Gamers are going to understand who we are, and we've been burnt incredibly badly. And so in this case, always listen to your customer. That's the first bit when it comes down to um, localization. The second thing that we've learned in the past couple of years is that it's important to have local managers. Your mileage may vary. I think different companies will, will do different things. Some people like to have a strong base and parachute managers everywhere in the, in, the, in the world. For ourselves, we believe in having a single global culture. So we've got nine offices worldwide. We've got about 800 employees right now. We've gone a little further up north of that. And every single one of these offices, we make sure that they're all in-country GMs, every single one of them. There's a single company culture. Why? Because in short, you can't make everyone happy. That's a truism. But you can, with a global culture, make everyone understand why they're not. That's the important thing. Have a single global culture to talk to everyone. I mean, I just got news that um, one of our offices got just won the best place to work at, for example. And that's great. It's a great award. But we know that a global culture is really a means to tell everyone this is why this is the grand norm. This is the foundation. This is how you know, we will deal with um, matters that come about. This is why we will stay true to our vision. And we continue to do that. Finally, investors. So to share our own perspective, I think, on this, and, and again, your mileage may vary. I was in a conference yesterday where, where um, different people had different perspectives of, of investors. 
one of the guys on, the, on stage at that point of time yesterday said, I never had any help from our investors. Now, we, we have had a huge amount of help from our investors, but when we were raising capital, we were very judicious on who we picked. We didn't look for the highest price. We didn't look for any of that. We wanted to make sure, and this is one of those things I urge every single one of you to do, whether you're an investor or whether you're raising capital, it's important to look for strategic investors with a shared vision. And this shared vision is also incredibly important with a long-term mindset. So when we first started out, we said, okay, great. What kind of investors did we want? And we knew right from the start, by the way, we knew right from the start that we wanted to be a global company. So we said, okay, what's going to work out at the point of time? Every single thing is a strategic decision for us. And we said, we want the number one Chinese VC, and we want you know, a really great Valley VC at the same time. So we picked IDG, we picked Excel Partners, great VCs in their own right from a global sense. And we said, okay, if we're going to go into things like um, laptops and, and other devices, Intel Capital, that's a great partner for us. And they had a great reputation. They have a great reputation from a global perspective. And most recently, we knew we were going to come to Hong Kong. We needed the telco relationship and the, the um, mobile partnership. We were really honored to be able to work. We are really honored to be able to work with Mr. Lee Ka Sheng, one of the most prominent investors in Hong Kong. But all of these decisions, right from the get go, always pick and choose your investors wisely. And I'll give you an anecdote from this perspective. So when we decided to go into laptops, for example, some, one of our investor pools said, absolutely not. In the history of the company, there was only one investor who said, I'm going to sell out everything and it doesn't make sense for me. Because he was, an ex, he was, a, he was a guy that, that was an expert in PCs. He had been shipping PCs all his life. And he said, it's impossible. No one's ever going to be able to do it. I've been doing this for 20, 30 years. Don't ever do it. It's going to destroy the company. And that was many years ago. Today, he calls me all the time and says, damn it, I should have sold my stock. <laughs> right? But, but that's the thing. It's important to be absolutely transparent to everyone, to share with them what your vision is, both ways, both from the investor to say what they can share, and both from your own perspective to be able to share with your investors to say, this is my vision, this is where I'm going to go. Come hell or high water, I'm going to go ahead with it. We don't want to be a, a, a small peripherals company. We don't want to be a, a, a small uh, software platform company. We want to gun for the stars. We want to build this to be a true global business and make sure that the fun life is going to be there. I think that's one. And number two, that they have the stomach to grow alongside with you. Because the guys that want to have a short-term win will just go for the short-term win anyway. It's fine. It's good. Always pick your investors very, very wisely. Because it's a partnership. It's a marriage. It's understanding two people. And to date, we've been blessed with, have, with having really, truly great investors who understand truly what we're doing. And so find those investors that understand what you do Find those investors that understand exactly what your vision is, share it in a really transparent manner, and go with it. So bear in mind that investors, and many of you as you raise capital may be concerned about it, but know that investors have a choice of who to invest in. But never, never forget, startups have a choice of who their investors are. It's not a one-way street. It's a partnership. For ourselves, you know, at Razor, we formed our own kind of a venture, corporate venture capital fund. We invest in new startups because we want them to, we, we tell them that, look, we've gone through this together with you. We call it Z Ventures, Z Gold, Z Ventures, Z, you know, you get the idea. So we invest in them and we say, come onto our platform. We will help you. If you're a hardware company, boom, we will get you distributed through the rest of the world. If you're a software company, boom, 35 million users onto your platform immediately. Or if you're a, if you need to find a way to monetize it, we've got a virtual currency or virtual credit system platform that you can avail yourself throughout. Investors have a choice of who to invest in. You, the startups, have a choice to pick who your shareholders are. So in short, you know, and I'm making great time, I'm just right on the dot. The first 
lesson we've learned in the past 12 years going global is to do one thing well, keep doing it well, and repeat it over and over again. It's really hard, but execution is key. Vision is also key. Always stay true to your vision, and it's easier said than done because everyone with the best intentions will dissuade you from your vision. People who want to help you will tell you no. People who want to have, have the best intentions for you will tell you, please don't do what you're planning on doing. Always stay true to that. And finally, it's always about the people, the customer, the team, your investors. So thank you very much. Those are the three lessons we've learned, and we'll do the Q&A. Thank you.